Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Jacob Demery and I am a second year law student at Georgetown. I am also the Healthcare Justice Issue Director for the Law Center's chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. Tonight we have a very exciting event bringing together academic, governmental, and legal minds to explore the theme of healthcare justice in the time of COVID-19. We will hear from a preeminent public health scholar to first learn what happened and why we're here now. Then we'll move on to a panel discussion where you can ask questions about the state and future of legal practice amid a pandemic. We will discuss compelling questions like how do public health requirements impact constituents' access to justice and social services, and how has the coronavirus pandemic sparked intersecting calls for healthcare, racial, and economic justice. This event is also exciting because it kicks off the, a series of discussions sponsored by the ACLU of Georgetown Law. The other issue directors are preparing excellent conversations, and I hope that you'll be inspired to join us over the next few months. If you'd like to sign up for our email list, you can use the link in the description below. Tonight, we'll begin with a lecture by University Professor Lawrence Gostin. Professor Gostin has directed public health institutions ranging from our O'Neill Institute to the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on National and Global Health Law. He's been recognized for his many contributions by the Council on Foreign Relations, the American Public Health Association, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. Professor Gossen has been appointed to positions in organizations including the CDC, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, UNICEF, the Lancet, and the ACLU. During COVID-19, he has served as a trusted expert for Georgetown and the world, and we are honored that he, would be, he is willing to speak with us tonight. So it is my pleasure to turn over the discussion to Professor Gostin. Uh, thanks very much, Jacob. Um, I really do appreciate it. And I just want to begin um, by addressing uh, the Georgetown University uh, community uh, specifically, and also for those on who will be watching this on YouTube, um, to all students out there. Um, you know, you're going through uh, a once in a lifetime public health crisis. Uh, it's been agonizing for you. You have had to go and take your classes remotely, not be part of you know, your social networks with your friends and your family. Uh, and I just want to salute you um, for, you are the future leaders. And, and I hope that going forward, you um, will bring us truly uh, global health with justice, working in your communities, your country, and the world. So um, I tip my hat to you, the students um, who are our future, and, and I hope you keep your passion um, throughout your careers and your lifetime and your decency. Let me just, I have a lot to cover, and so forgive me if I go quite quickly. Um, I. I had planned something, but then um, the, there was a book that came out with tapes from Bob Woodward um, about the president's actions, and particularly in relation to his historical actions uh, during COVID-19. And so what I wanna do is begin by discussing, you know, the, the truly awesome nature of this particular pathogen and the battle between mother nature and science I then want to go um, and talk a, a, about the Woodward tapes and what it tells us and teaches us. And thirdly, if I've got time, I'm going to look at about seven critical lessons that we've learned from the COVID um, pandemic that I hope um, will, will make for a safer, secure, and more uh, decent, humane future. Um, but the path is ours to take. Um, either one of coercion or one um, that embraces human rights and social justice. I hope we take that latter path. Um, so let me begin um, by just making this observation. Um, this is the most probable historical timeline. Um, sometime probably in early or mid-December, we don't know the exact time, um, there was a zoonotic event. Um, that zoonotic event um, most likely took place at the Wuhan wet market in Wuhan, uh, in wider Hubei province in China. 
Um, this little um, uh, microorganism that we can't see, uh, which we've now identified as SARS-CoV-2, um, a coronavirus um, that causes COVID-19, um, then leaped from a bat to an intermediary animal to a human, and then almost immediately started spreading exponentially, um, first through the city of Wuhan, um, then um, throughout mainland China, uh, and then it went like a tsunami um, through East Asia, Europe, uh, the Americas, and now it's marching through the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Middle East, um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so literally in a matter of weeks or months, this little microorganism um, truly circumnavigated the globe. Um, it's controlled every single life on this planet. Um, we're all in this together, although we experience it very differently, uh, depending if we're rich or poor, black, white, or, or uh, other uh, circumstance of, of our birth um, in terms of our socioeconomic status. Um, since that time, there's been a, you know, a scientific rush to try to you know, find out how does it, uh, how does it travel, um, what is the most efficient mode of transmission, uh, what is the, the, the methods of its pathology in the body, it turns out that it's you know, highly transmissible. Um, it's almost the perfect virus because uh, it's highly uh, lethal, but not so lethal that it kills all of its hosts and dies out. It's very highly transmissible, not as much as measles, but as much probably more than influenza. Um, and it has highly complex still unknown effects on uh, human beings. Uh, so it, it really is a biological specimen and science has started um, to fight it. And so we're, we're at war between an awesome force of mother nature and the equally awesome force of humankind's ability to innovate, embrace science and combat it. Ultimately, we will win, us humans, we will win. Um, but not before it's going to take um, probably millions of lives around the globe, um, cause suffering, economic and social collapse, mental health, um, distress, suicides and the like. Um, but I envisage that by this time next year, uh, we will be pulling ourselves out of it. And I would predict now um, that Georgetown Law and the other students looking will be back on campus, enjoying your social activities um, with a safe and effective vaccine. Um, and so uh, that's where we are. Um, the United States has done you know, particularly badly um, with this virus. Um, very early on, just looking historically, when I talked about uh, this zoonautical leap, um, you know, sometime in early January, um, President Trump was praising Xi Jinping. Um, very soon afterward, by February, um, he was calling it the China virus or the Wuhan virus. He was blaming China because um, he felt that China didn't disclose the full extent of this problem. And I think truly unforgivably in the eyes of historians, uh, in the midst of an historic pandemic, um, he's placed the World Health Organization, our only global health agency, um, in the middle of a geopolitical struggle between China and the United States. Since that time, um, he has uh, written a letter to uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, um, informing uh, the Secretary General that the U.S. intends to withdraw from the World Health Organization um, it, within a year's time, which is the, ma the, the mandatory um, delay time under U.S. and international law. Um, he's also very recently announced that he's going to withhold the remaining um, payments of dues that the United States owes to the WHO, 
which is blatantly unlawful under the United States um, uh, legal system. We 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 have a uh, joint resolution of Congress that says otherwise, um, and it's a sad event because um, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, well, instrumental in the formation of the UN and the um, and the uh, World Health Organization, which is his first specialized agency. Um, but the what the president has said was is that the World Health Organization and China should have informed him sooner in February um, that this was a near existential threat. But now we know from the Woodward tapes that the president was re- was briefed uh, clearly in no uncertain terms about this being the major national security threat of his administration and maybe in generations since the 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, and the president uh, said that he understood that risk. Nonetheless, um, He told the American public that this was China's fault, WHO's fault, had he known he would have done something, but he didn't. Instead, um, the president uh, decided to downplay um, the virus, said it was more like an influenza, that it would go away, um, with many kinds of um, denials of science in terms of hyping unapproved uh, uh, treatments like uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, and uh, most recently um, uh, 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 convalescent plasma. Uh, He's also um, done everything um, that is possible um, to change the course of this pandemic, the opposite of that. Um, So for example, Countries that have done well, Germany, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, um, they've all used a formula um, that was basically um, surge capacity in the hospitals, high capacity for public health infrastructure, testing, uh, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, um, to have a national plan for a lockdown uh, where necessary, um, and to embrace, most importantly, science. Um, The president did none of that, knowing, as we now know from the Woodward tapes, um, that he was well informed uh, of these risks. Uh, And uh, history will, uh, I think, hold the president to account. I think he should be held politically accountable, but I don't think Um, that the courts um, or the legal system can hold them to account for that because as misguided as his actions were, um, they were within the course of his um, presidential discretion. Um, It was a a discretion that was exercised in a way that I do believe that there were tens of thousands of preventable deaths in the United States uh, had we acted in the way that other countries have acted or even closely. Um, So the Woodward tapes tell us a lot. They tell us a lot about the United States response. They tell us a lot about um, the World Health Organization and China. Um, And they also remind us of the importance of good governance, transparency, um, good communication and messaging with the population. The president said, and the one thing is quite understandable, that he did not want to create a panic, he told Bob Woodward. And of course he shouldn't. In my view, however, the the way to actually create a panic um, is to not be truthful um, with the American public. It's better to tell the public honestly and in a timely way exactly what we know, what we don't know, and what we're going to do to find out what we don't know. But none of that happened. Uh, And the uh, public was uh, misled. And I think that creates a sense of fear, panic, and confusion. Um, By not telling the truth, 
Um, that is what causes a panic. So what are the lessons um, of the great coronavirus pandemic of 2020? Um, I think there are seven. The first is that you have to have a robust health and public health system um, uh, with surge capacity uh, in your hospital system and a public health infrastructure of the kind that I've talked about is critically important. Now, I don't know if any of you remember, but in the Oval Office earlier on in the pandemic, the president waved a, uh, a, a paper that said, that the United States was ranked number one in pandemic preparedness. That was by the Global Health Security Index. I was part of the team that did that rating and assessment. But what we've learned is, is that you need leadership to actually unleash um, health system potential. And absent leadership, uh, it can be a disaster. So the United States was number one in pandemic preparedness and near the bottom of the table in terms of actual performance, a critical lesson learned. Um, the second is related, it's, it's leadership and trust. Um, I've mentioned the Global Health Security Index and I've mentioned um, the importance of gaining the public's trust by being honest um, with consistent scientific messaging. Um, and the second thing, that is cru cru crucially important is leadership that embraces science. Uh, you know, science makes mistakes. We're operating in a world of a novel disease where there's scientific uncertainty. We all understand that. Um, the CDC early on said that masks were ineffective, so did WHO, but it turns out that masks are highly effective. Um, we tell the American public what we know at the time. And as the facts change, as the science understands more, we explain that and why that never happened. Which leads me to the third lesson, which is indeed the integrity of science and public health. Just think about what science has been able to achieve. Literally within a week after China reported the first case of the coronavirus um, to uh, the World Health Organization, Chinese scientists sequenced the entire genome of that virus and shared that widely across the scientific community one week. We've learned in a very, very short period of time what the major epidemiological um, aspects of SARS-CoV-2 are. Um, we know uh, that it um, can linger in the air and that it's an aerosolized spread. We know that asymptomatic individuals can spread it and a majority of the spread is there. We know it, it can move in clusters or what some people colloquially call super spreader events. We've seen that in nursing homes, cruise ships, prisons, and other um, entities. Um, and we also know that um, outdoor uh, events, socially distanced, are relatively safe. Indoor events um, where people are congregated together, whether in a, in a, in a house of worship or a political rally, um, can be major amplifying events. We've all learned that through epidemiological um, research. Um, biologically, um, we have a promising treatment. It's still not fully approved, convalescent plasma as well as um, steroid treatment. Um, there are many more treatments on the horizon. Uh, most remarkably, it normally takes 10 to 15 years to get a vaccine. Um, we never did get a, uh, an HIV vaccine. Um, it took us many, 20 probably Ebola epidemics before we got an Ebola vaccine. Now, the latest data from the World Health Organization are that there are uh, nine um, highly pro promising vaccines in phase three clinical trials, which are the final phase clinical trials. They won't all succeed, but there are about 170 other vaccine candidates behind it. So I predict that if the uh, 
political class allows public health agencies, principally the US FDA, the CDC, to rely on science that we will get a vaccine uh, within um, probably by the end of the year um, that will be uh, 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 manufactured at, at um, scale um, probably by midsummer. And that's why I think that by the end of the summer, we'll really be pulling ourselves out of this pandemic. But it's really going to be important to be um, equitable and make sure that we allow the science to progress. The fourth um, is that we need to invest in research and development. We need to have a research and development capacity in interpandemic periods, that is before a pandemic strikes, so that we can have platforms for vaccine and drug um, development. Um, the National Academy of Sciences uh, expert panel, of which I was a member, uh, recommended um, an incremental increase of one billion US dollars um, per year in an additional spending on research and development. It turns out that we need to do much more than that. For example, the World Bank um, predicted that a coronavirus pandemic will cost more than 5% drop in global GDP. So investing in science is crucial. Um, the fifth may be the most important, um, and that is the issue of equity and justice. This is really critically important. Even before COVID, I thought that the, the prevailing um, uh, social narrative, not just in the United States, but worldwide, uh, was one of injustice, um, economic injustice, social injustice, racial injustice, and health injustice. Uh, Martin Luther King, I thought, said it best when he said, all injustice, all inequity um, is unconscionable, but health inequity is the most unconscionable of all of the uh, inequalities. And I do believe that he was right. Uh, and we've seen that with COVID. Um, we've seen uh, that um, African-Americans or black communities in the United States and in other countries have suffered disproportionately. We've seen that with American Indians, uh, Native Alaskans and others, other in indigenous uh, populations. Um, we've seen the poor and working class, the so-called heroes, the essential workers, um, being really, really hard hit. You know, and maybe, you know, it's fine if you can be locked down at home and you've got a stocked fridge and you've got um, cupboards and you've got a job that's bringing in income. But if you've got to go to work as an essential worker, um, then or you're unemployed, um, it's devastating. Um, we could have hundreds of thousands of people evicted uh, in the United States, uh, homeless, um, including kids. Uh, so the injustice is palpable and COVID-19, that's its greatest lesson. The sixth is evidence-based laws and the rule of law. Um, I wrote after 9-11, uh, and, and uh, uh, tomorrow is 9-11, uh, we had a series of anthrax attacks in the United States. Many of you may be too young to even remember that. Um, the CDC um, asked me to lead a national uh, group um, to write an Emergency Health Powers Act, um, which I did. And that's been adopted, you know, not just in most states in the United States, but globally in, in, in many countries around the world. So it's been very successful. But at the time, I could never have even dreamed that you could lock down a city the size of Beijing, London, New York. Um, when Wuhan was locked down and wider Hubei province, I thought, well, that would be unimaginable in Europe or the United States, but it soon happened. And then of course, the China lockdown was nothing compared to the one in India, where over a billion people um, were locked down. 
These have enormous consequences and we don't fully understand them. Um, many people around the world have died of COVID. Many more because of COVID have died of HIV AIDS, um, malaria, tuberculosis, diabetes, heart disease, cancer. All of these things have been amplified throughout the planet and particularly in the United States. And so we have to understand what the evidence is behind these kinds of interventions. Beyond that, um, it's very clear that a number of leaders have used the coronavirus pandemic as a, as a ruse for um, uh, violating the rule of law. Um, we see that in uh, Russia, Turkey, Hungary, and other places. Uh, the UN has even formed a rule of law um, uh, panel based upon COVID um, to make sure that, that we use and maintain good governance throughout all countries in the world. And then finally, uh, um, the lesson is the importance of, of global institutions. Um, the, the United Nations itself, about to celebrate its 75th anniversary, um, the World Health Organization, its first specialized agency, UNICEF, others, have played a really crucial role in this, but they have been marginalized. Um, I talked uh, uh, very recently um, by phone with Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, who told me who, who I could feel the hurt in his heart about being placed in the position that the United States has placed him in. He said, Larry, you know, it's not the money. We've already more than doubled the money from, the, from, from this. We, it's really about U.S. leadership, and we miss it. Uh, and I hope we will get that back one day. We all, you know, the, the World Health Organization is important. It's made mistakes. And heavens knows I've worked with them for 30 years, and they can be, you know, maddeningly bureaucratic. But they're working around the clock, hardworking, compassionate people, including Dr. Tedros. What this teaches us is the final lesson, and that is, you know, we're all in this together. As I said, um, SARS-CoV-2, this little microscopic virus, um, has controlled us all. It's taken over the world. No life on this planet has not been affected, no human being. Now, we're affected in very, very different ways, as I've mentioned, you know, depending upon our social, racial, and other circumstance. Um, but nonetheless, we are in this together. And, you know, we've seen the, con, you know, the, the combining in almost synergistic way of, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, um, police violence, protests about that around the world, and um, the coronavirus. Um, these two are separate events, but, they, but, they, but they're together. They can't be understood separately because they're both about a sense of grievance and a sense of injustice. So I would just end by saying that, you know, we, we, we actually have two paths that we can take following um, COVID-19. Uh, one path is, you know, to double down on nationalism, vaccine nationalism, my country first, um, and strong men leaders who violate um, the rule of law, uh, ignore science, um, or we can take another path. We can embrace science. We can embrace um, uh, scientific evidence. We can understand that you know, good science leads to good ethics, leads to good law. We can embrace good governance, accountability, transparency, human rights. Um, and we can embrace um, the rule of law and the importance of both global health, that is health for all, including universal health coverage for everyone, um, but also health with justice. And um, that is an equitable distribution of the good of, of health. Um, what your mother told you is that health is the most important thing you have. She was right. Also, your rights and your dignity are the most important thing that you have. Everybody has that as an inalienable and equal right. 
no one should be left um, in the position where they don't get good health, where they can't live, live a good and decent life with dignity and human rights. And that's why you, the next generation, I'm now handing the baton to you. Uh, it's for you to fight for health and justice going forward. And I really believe that we will see a new world, one that embraces science, uh, understands existential threats from climate change and pandemics or nuclear catastrophe, and that you will do something about it. Um, so thank you very much for organizing this. It's been my deep pleasure and, and uh, honor to be with you. Um, and then I'll hand it back over to you, Jacob, for a really terrific panel. Thank you very much, Professor. And actually, right before that panel, you, you gave us a lot to think about, and specifically in your last comments and in the fifth lesson about the notions of equity and justice. And you said that it's in our hands. So I, just before we transition to the panel, I was wondering if you had any suggestions for law students as well as lawyers uh, in working in, either in health policy spaces or in justice spaces uh, during a pandemic? How can we bring about a world that's guided by science and not by fear? You know what? Um, each person can embrace their own um, way of making a difference. Um, the important thing is to understand that it is up to each one of you to make a difference and then choose a vehicle to do it. You might do it just um, as neighbors, you know, go and um, phone or socially distance with someone who is vulnerable um, or in a safe way, you know, protest against injustice and police violence um, or um, uh, racial uh, injustice um, or um, donate or provide services in kind um, to homeless shelters or prisons, fight for um, the rights of asylum seekers um, or climate change, um, be active politically um, to, to really um, uh, have your voice um, at the ballot box or be global. Um, if you want to work specifically, you know, we'd love to have great uh, hands and help at the um, O'Neill Institute. We have a, a medical legal partnership or a health justice alliance um, at the law school. Um, we've got clinics that are devoted to, to justice, centers and institutes on from you know climate change to to human rights to, to to local government and good governments governance. All of these things. There's so many opportunities and. I know not just me as, as the faculty director of the O'Neill Institute and a faculty member, but all of the faculty, all of the centers and institutes would really love to work for, with you and hear from you. Um, so please, um, however you want to make your contribution, that's up to your heart and your conscience, but please make one. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, especially for that last comment and for a very illuminating lecture. Now, I have, My the, I have the great privilege of turning over the conversation to our panelists. And if you have any questions or would like the, the panelists to discuss a certain question, you can use the chat feature on YouTube and we'll review your questions and attempt to incorporate them into the discussion. Sure. And if I may, Jacob, I would just want to um, apologize in advance because I'm going to have to leave for another um, event just after a couple of questions. And I just wanted to apologize in advance for that. Oh, no, thank you so much, Professor, for all, um, all that you do outside of the panel and, and all of your contributions as well. So we have four panelists on uh, the docket tonight. First, we're gonna hear, uh, or we're gonna hear tonight from Mayor Muriel Bowser. So Mayor Bowser was the first woman ever reelected as the mayor of Washington, DC. She has a distinguished record of public service, having been a council member for the District of Columbia, where she served as the chair for the Committee on Economic Development. Mayor Bowser began her career in local government as an advisory neighborhoods commissioner in the Riggs Park neighborhood. And we're going to discuss with uh, Mayor Bowser later on in the panel about her specific efforts uh, in the field of racial justice amid a pandemic. 
Tonight, we're also joined by Professor Caitlin Banner, Deputy Legal Director for the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. There, she helps direct the committee's education and public accommodations work. Professor Banner has also worked with the Advancement Project's Opportunity to Learn program and at the ACLU. She currently serves as an adjunct professor at Georgetown with our Juvenile Justice Clinic. We also have the honor of speaking with Ms. Julia McPherson from Jesuit Refugee Service USA. Ms. McPherson is the Director of Advocacy and Operations at JRS and has experience working with non-governmental organizations such as CARE, Interaction, and the Aspen Institute. Finally, we are joined by Mr. John Mulholland, Chief of Staff for New Jersey Assemblywoman Carol Murphy. Mr. Mulholland has worked on campaigns and in local government in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. He has experienced working on the constituent as well as policy sides of state government in New Jersey and is currently running for fire commissioner in Cherry Hill. We are thrilled uh, to have you all for us, uh, all with us for this discussion this evening. And our discussion of healthcare justice is framed by a number of intersecting issues. So tonight we're going to begin with access to justice understood as access to legal systems and uh, government more specifically. However, then we'll transition to understand the challenges faced by constituents and varying constituencies served by the panelists here. After that, we'll transition to discuss specific access to social services, such as health care and education, as well as the fights for racial justice and economic justice that have strengthened during the pandemic. Finally, we'll turn back to legal systems and ask how institutions like Georgetown, as well as law students and lawyers alike, can contribute to the fight for justice during a pandemic. So to begin, I'm going to ask the panelists to tell us about your work and generally how it has changed to respond to COVID-19. And it'd be great if we could start uh, with Mr. Mulholland for this question. Uh, John, I think that you're muted for this. First, uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this very important conversation. As you, as you mentioned, when you introduced my background, I'm the chief of staff for a, a state legislator. And so I th always think about the three buckets of work we engage, and I think they all changed. So there's obviously the, the policy uh, legislation sort of piece of the, the role. There is the, the community engagement piece, and then there's the constituent service piece of it. And uh, they, all, they all changed dramatically. In terms of uh, policy, one of the most immediate transformations is, of course, when you are in a genuine state of emergency and you have a health emergency, a lot of decisions are made by executive orders. And so we, we in New Jersey were blessed with the governor who had one of the most effective responses to the coronavirus. But in terms of actual policy making, that took a lot of the uh, immediate transparency out of the process. So whenever people needed to make sure something was considered by the decision maker, there was very much a scramble to sort of reach out to every legislator you can, every mayor you can, to make sure those concerns were bubbled up. A very practical situation that we dealt with in New Jersey was there was one of our counties was going to do a, a order that was stronger than the rest of the state and would have potentially shut down manufacturing. And the manufacturing community rallied together and there ultimately was an executive order saying those de determinations are gonna be made at the state level. In terms of community outreach, that was, as we talked about just with educating uh, university students earlier on, that was entirely turned on its head. Events, traditional in-person events almost ceased to exist. The capacity to meet in person stopped. So then we moved to platforms like Zoom, use, utilization of conference calls, uh, trying to do virtual town hall meetings, and then eventually moving into sort of socially distanced, uh, you know, resource fairs and that sort of thing. And perhaps the most dramatic transformation was, of course, in the constituent service piece, because the volume just Cast, increased exponentially overnight. I mean, just, in, and you know, obviously this will come up more in the conversation, but in terms of just unemployment cases alone, and then the inability, you know, that, that these systems weren't necessarily prepared to scale up as quickly as they should. There was a component of interaction between the federal and state government that really created issues there. And then when individuals weren't able to get immediate assistance in those cases, then we had to start providing other Issue. So if we couldn't get their unemployment issue resolved as quickly as possible, then you end up hitting a food scarcity issue or issues with other agencies like Motor Vehicle Commission, that sort of thing. So in short, it utterly transformed the entire role. 
great. Uh, so, Ms. McPherson, could you continue? Just describe your, your, your work and how it's changed uh, in response to the current pandemic. Sure. Thank you, Jacob. So um, JRS, Jesuit Refugee Service, is an international humanitarian organization. We operate in 50 plus countries around the world, serving about 800,000 plus uh, refugees and other forcibly displaced persons. So to, to give the audience a bit of a sort of a global sense of the impact of the pandemic on our work and those that we serve, it's been dramatic to say the least. Um, I would say to start things off that initially when COVID-19 was pronounced a pandemic, um, we and others in our sector were extremely concerned on the impact that it would have on those that we serve. Working with refugees and forcibly displaced persons, you know, these are individuals, families who live oftentimes in refugee camps or in urban areas in very small, limited, cramped quarters, oftentimes multifamily um, units and they already are at um, a high disadvantage in terms of being the most vulnerable among the community where communities in which they live, oftentimes in their host communities. So in terms of having very minimal access to sanitation, to healthcare systems, um, to, um, to other social services, they are already at a significant disadvantage. So we were extremely concerned that refugees would be disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Thankfully, what we've seen is that um, those kinds of numbers that, that some organizations, the UN in particular, were, were predicting haven't come to fruition, but I think that's primarily due to um, quick action in terms of educating the populations we serve. Um, some of these populations are also remote, so perhaps more isolated from, um, from the impact of the pandemic. So thankfully, the numbers, again, were not what we thought they might be. But again, a lot of that was due to the fact that we as JRS and other organizations were, had to really pivot really overnight in terms of our programming. So we focused a lot of our programming on providing access to education for refugees from pre-primary to primary, secondary, and even higher education. We had to change our programming in terms of being able to offer those programs from afar, um, distance learning, and that in and of itself is a challenge, making sure that the students we serve have access to materials, to the internet, which is very rare in a lot of the places where we work. Um, so even providing those services were a challenge, but we had to start from the basics, making sure that they had access to soap, to clean water, um, to a safe space. And you know, talk, we might talk a little bit more about the health impact and the psychosocial impact, but um, the refugees that we serve already, many of them have experienced significant trauma and isolation. Um, and the pandemic on top of that has created serious concerns for them. So we, we had to pivot into more of an emergency assistance type of programming, making sure they had basic needs, Many of them were working in the informal sector, so making sure they had access to some kind of income or cash so they could support themselves and their families. A lot of those jobs that they were working, if they were lucky to even have some kind of income generating opportunity, disappeared overnight. So, um, so that just gives you perhaps a snapshot of, of what we were able to do in a short amount of time and happy to go into a bit more detail as we continue. Great. Thank you so much. And now, Professor Banner, uh, would you be able to explain basically your work and how it has changed uh, to respond to the needs of constituents during COVID-19? Of course. Thanks so much um, for having me. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel and to hear from my fellow panelists as well. So at the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs, um, we work on systemic litigation on a broad range of civil rights cases, making sure that we are, in all of our cases, thinking about the racial justice impact and the historical effects and impact of segregation on all of the systems in which we work and how we can use the law to help address that and to reform that. COVID affected almost everything we do. Um, we work on the criminal legal system reform. We work in employment justice and workers' rights. We work on disability justice and access. We work on education. Um, and in every single one of these areas, um, people were affected and different problems um, were arising. And what we saw in March and in April and in the months since is that really we switched to crisis response mode like many other people. Um, how do we understand how we can use the law to help the people who are most vulnerable? So I, th I th thought a little bit about sort of how did our work look from March till now? And I really see it almost in three buckets. So the first set of work 
um, was really thinking about the most vulnerable people. Um, as Professor Gostin mentioned earlier, um, people in prison, people in nursing homes, in psychiatric institutions, in these congregate settings, um, we knew from very early on that the pandemic was spreading quickly and that people were dying. Um, these are places where people are often um, are not having great health care to begin with, um, and the living situations to which they were forced into and unable to leave made it so they were particularly vulnerable to catching COVID. So the Washington Lawyers Committee, as well as many other legal organizations across the city and country, I think really shifted to see how we could address that problem. Sort of the second round of emergency um, was dealing with the huge impacts um, that the COVID-19 pandemic was having on our economy and on our people's ability to earn their wages, to um, have economic justice. And again, this pandemic, while we are all in this together, it affects people really differently. And I think it's important for us to think about who has the ability to work from home, who has the ability to keep working and who is out of a job and what safety nets exist and what safety nets don't exist. Um, and so we were able to, to shift to try to address some of um, the inequities that we saw rising out of that. And then last, you know, we, we are still thinking about and engaging in how is COVID changing things long term? Um, I was going for a walk in my neighborhood the other day and somebody had a sign up um, outside on their lawn and it said, do we want to really get back to normal or do we want to build something better? And I think that's a really important question because um, the normal wasn't great for a lot of people um, and a lot of people were disenfranchised and left out of that economy. And so how do we think about how COVID has really, um, how are we going to come back from COVID and how do we come back in a way that's more equitable and more just for um, all people in our society? Great. So, thank you so, much. so, so along those lines, Professor Banner, how have specifically access to justice changed during COVID-19 and how, what changes in the way governments function have made it more difficult for constituents to access legal processes as well as elected officials? Sure. So everything has been upended, right? I think it's a theme of our evening that um, this pandemic has changed everything. You know, Sometime in mid-March, we shifted from a system of justice, a system of courts, a system of elected officials from an in-person, engaging people in meetings, um, uh, going to court for your hearings to an all virtual world. Um, and when we think about what an all virtual world means, we have to think about who doesn't have internet, um, who doesn't have regular cell phone service, um, and who doesn't have the ability to access a virtual world. Um, we know that there's a lot of people for whom that is a particular challenge um, and who haven't had the um, either the technology and the utilities to do that and also the training and the experience to do that. I want to give two examples of um, people who I think um, were particularly affected by this. So one is what does equal access for people with disabilities mean in a virtual world? Um, one thing is that on a really positive side, um, some of the things that we change to do are things that people with disabilities have been fighting for for a really long time. Um, the ability to zoom into a class, the ability to um, do things asynchronously, which is sort of a buzzword in the education world. Um, but there are a lot of things that as we shifted virtually um, got left out of the, the equation or left out of the solution. And so, for example, um, the Washington Lawyers Committee worked with a whole host of organizations, including the American Council of the Blind um, and the um, Disability Law Center in Virginia um, and with others around the country to think about voting. What does it mean to vote in a, in a virtual world? Um, and how, if you are blind, do you vote on a absentee mailed you paper ballot if you can't read those words and you can't fill out the paper? Um, and so we've been with those groups, both filing litigation and exploring solutions around the country um, with Brown Goldstein Levy, a, a law firm with whom we work, and Shepard Mullen, to really think about what does that mean and how do we get access to ballots that are accessible for people. Another thing that's been really challenging, and I'll um, pass it on, is language barriers. Um, sometimes those are much easier to manage in person. Um, sometimes um, as we've shifted to websites, they're in English only, as we've shifted, shifted to um, call-in centers or things like that, um, it can be really challenging for people with language barriers to access that. So I just wanted to flag those two groups as, as folks who I think have been, you know, particularly affected by, by access to the government services. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mulholland, building off of that, uh, what, what are the greatest challenges facing the constituents that you interact with on a legislative basis in New Jersey, and, and especially during COVID-19? And how has your office uh, reacted to address those issues? 
Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think it, it shares with some of the same points the professor just brought up. But like you've always had a population of individuals who you would need to help with in person that either because they're on the other side, the digital divide or just for their capacity reasons would be the people that you would be normally needing to meet with in person or having them do something in a physical document. So whether just for, for economic access reasons, for just a lack of ability to use technology or for some of the, the disability challenges. So figuring out the best ways to work with that, fortunately, uh, our office and a lot of the offices we work with had become more more comfortable like accepting like a photo of something like that that level of perfection on making sure something is a clean scan we were able to tolerate around but i think it's a real reminder that conversations that we had put off for so long about digital upgrades in the public sector because nobody wants to spend money on them and it's not a glamorous topic need to be thought about i you know in terms of and you see that on every level on the on the user end even even if you are tech savvy, the capacity to sign something digitally doesn't even always exist. So you, maybe you don't have access to a printer, you don't own a printer, those pieces of things. Um, in terms of specific constituencies, we ran into issues early on. We had issues with individuals with disabilities who needed grocery deliveries being denied the use of their EBT card because individuals didn't want to touch it when we thought that the virus was primarily spread through touch. And so that was an example of something where we've built a program, a federal program that doesn't allow you to make these orders over the internet or over the phone without certain waivers. And so people are being denied food because we hadn't come up with a way to do that in a, in a touchless environment. Uh, we also, uh, you run into sort of issues um, from our, our, we had issues come up to us from first responders who were just worried about what was gonna to happen to them, they had to continue to go out there and work. You think about your firefighters, your EMS, your police. If, if God forbids one of them were to die in the line of duty, which we had some instances or get disabled because of COVID-19, uh, their, their benefits almost require that you would have to prove that they contracted in the line of duty. And that's almost an impossible burden to bear. So we, as a, as a legislature, actually flipped the burden and made it a, pres a rebuttable presumption that if you are one of these first these defined first responders that we assume for the purposes of death benefits or disability benefits that you, you caught COVID-19 in the line of duty. And then I think the other piece that we run into is just all of these sort of digital concerns about just making sure the reliability and access of internet. Uh, we, had, we, had, you know, we had stories of students who would have to use Wi-Fi from the library's parking lot, which is you know, a tragic scenario that if we're gonna to go to truly truly remote or truly virtual, we need to make sure that people have the technology and the access to do things from home and, and have reliable internet. So there's just a few of the examples of how our constituents were impacted. Exactly, so, so Ms. McPherson, could you, you bring an interesting perspective here uh, with your work with refugees and asylum seekers. So both what are the biggest challenges facing them? And then also how do you see uh, access to healthcare education, other needs and social services changing as a result of this coronavirus for those uh, constituencies? So from a global refugee protection type of perspective, what we have to keep in mind is that wars, conflict, persecution haven't stopped in the midst of the pandemic. And so people who are fleeing for their lives in many cases are still doing so because of those reasons. So we are particularly concerned about asylum seekers in particular. So these are families, um, individuals who are leaving their country, trying to cross a border into a neighboring country um, to petition for asylum. And in particular at the U.S. southern border, you know, this has been an ongoing challenge, um, particularly individuals coming from the Northern Triangle of Central America, but other countries as well. I was in Mexico earlier this year in January um, when travel was still allowed and um, met with our staff in Mexico. And there were asylum seekers from um, Sub-Saharan Africa, from Cuba, um, from across Latin America, and certainly from, from Central America. So, so there's been an ongoing challenge of um, this bottleneck in, in Mexico of asylum seekers trying to make their way to the U.S., but it's really been um, put to a halt during the pandemic, not only in the U.S., but across the world. There are about 160 countries that 
at one point or another over the past six months have either partially or fully closed their borders. And only about 100 of those countries made any kind of exception for asylum seekers. And under international law, the Refugee Protection Convention um, and, and state laws, national laws, um, asylees are protected under those, um, those legal structures. And even under a pandemic and other circumstances, um, any individual who is fearful for their life should be able to petition for asylum. Unfortunately, the, the U.S. falls into one of those 100 countries who have not um, allowed asylum seekers to come into our borders since March. Over 40,000 um, individuals, including unaccompanied minors, have been turned away at our border, not even allowed to, um, to petition, at least to start the process, um, to petition for asylum. They've been turned back to Mexico and are waiting indefinitely in Mexico. We're tracking this every month. Um, the government, the U.S. government, hasn't opened the borders yet. They've made, they've made exceptions to other kinds of categories of people, but um, unfortunately, asylum seekers have been targeted in this case. And so this is a huge humanitarian situation that we see at the border. Um, it's, it's a denial of the rights that Professor Gaston was talking about earlier. There's inalienable rights that, that asylum seekers are, are, are um, afforded. And, and unfortunately, the U.S. has a long history of affording those rights, but, um, but because of the pandemic being used as, in many cases, an excuse to, um, to stop asylum as seekers at our border, we're seeing this problem um, become even more um, protracted. So it's a significant concern that, that we're tracking and I think one um, casualty of the pandemic for many people. Definitely. So Professor Banner, the, uh, the coronavirus, it's the same question for you as well. It's, it's impacted constituents' access to healthcare, education, other social services. So how have you, uh, through the Washington Lawyers Committee and also guided by your experience with the Juvenile Justice Clinic, uh, but how have you attempted to to bridge that gap that has uh, come up because of this pandemic? Sure. So, um, you know, we are at the Washington Lawyers Committee primarily use litigation as our tool to address injustices and civil rights violations. So we've been quite busy since March filing cases um, where we're unable to get resolution before that to try to address some of the various um, various injustices that we've seen come up through um, COVID-19. Um, and I'll give one example about how I think um, COVID-19 has sometimes been used as an excuse or has sort of things have snuck in because of the virus that are um, are not really aligned towards helping people. Um, one of the cases that we brought was against the Small Business Administration, which provided um, loans for people, um, uh, forgivable loans for people to under to to run their business under COVID-19. Um, and they had a um, really strict um, exclusionary provision for people who had ever had a felony. Um, and that is a huge number of people who are small business owners, because um, if you have a conviction in the past, you're often not able to get employment because we have really restrictive laws for employment. And so a lot of people start their own businesses and it's the way that they support their families and their communities. Um, and this was something that sort of got snuck into that um, loan program. Um, you know, we also had a series of litigation against institutions where people were housed involuntarily, like prisons, um, halfway houses, and um, uh, St. Elizabeth, which is a psychiatric institution here in Washington, D.C. Um, and we litigated many of those cases under emergency standards, seeking a temporary restraining order from the court or a preliminary injunction. Um, you know, this may answer a question, sort of the last question you asked, as well as a question I think you may ask in a little bit. But one really important role I think that lawyers were able to play in this time, not just at the committee, but beyond, was really starting to educate judges about what was happening with COVID-19. Um, what were the practices that institutions and government agencies needed to practice in order to keep people safe and to protect people? And really doing it in a way that that sort of explained to them the urgency. Um, you know, I think most lawyers and civil rights lawyers especially don't think of the law and the courts as being a place where things happen quickly um, and where we're able to get access to fast justice. Um, but in the COVID-19 situation, I think that was not true. I think we were able to get um, courts across the country to intervene um, in temporary restraining order, you know, issuing temporary restraining orders and preliminary injunctions. And I think that was in large part due to the ability of lawyers and the scientific community and experts to really educate and get that information in front of judges quickly so that they could make informed rulings. 
That's green. And that, makes sense. That, that shows how a variety of methods can uh, work together to accomplish similar goals. Uh, so along those lines, uh, the past few months have been marked by continued state violence against vulnerable populations. Police murdered, murdered George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, sparking public outrage and participation in the Black Lives Matter movement. Covert federal agents, too, were dispatched to quell protests, but these incidents are not unusual. Police have a history of disproportionately killing black people without cause, and the federal government frequently uses covert officers to arrest and detain immigrants. So how, how do you explain the increased attention to state violence, racial injustice, and economic injustice, and how, how, how do you recommend that lawyers and other organizations take part in these? And I think this is a question that um, really all of you have important perspectives to add. So we could begin with Mr. Holland and then work through Ms. Ms. McPherson and Professor Boehner, if that works. Yeah, no, I think on a very emotional level, we experienced a once in a generation health emergency that shut everything else down. Everything else seemed to stop except the unlawful killing of black men and women in the streets by bad police officers. And I think on a very emotional level, that was something that was hard for people to tolerate. I think when you also combine that with just the general fact that everything else was shut down from an attention perspective, it allowed people to really be forced to face this reality. It's not, it's not that individuals in this country didn't know it was happening, but when you literally, it's the only other news other than the pandemic, it sort of forces individuals who are in the community to come together and those who are out of the community to, to at a minimum say something. And I think that's where you saw a lot of, there was that immediate desire to make sure that you went to social media and made it clear where you stood. There was a desire to like either organize marches or other events, other Justice for George Floyd events. There was a really remarkable outpouring of, of support and energy just to sort of take to the streets. And it took it's different forms, obviously, in some situations that led to, to uh, destruction of property. But in other cases, you witnessed... Uh, police and community leaders and elected officials coming together in, in these really emotional, visible displays of solidarity. I think the important thing to, to push on, and I think that this is the reckoning moment, is, is what concrete changes have happened, and some have, but making sure that they're not just show, changes for show. Because I think every deliberative body in the country that cared about the issue was suddenly able to throw a ton of things on their agenda and pass a ton of things. But it's the challenge of, of, of lawyers and law students and social advocates to look at those things and make sure they actually do things that are gonna meaningfully address the issue. Yeah, I think from our pers perspective, you know, we're, we're a bit more removed from the core of this conversation, but the impact of, um, of what we see happening in our own country and and globally, really, with, with this movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, really um, transcending the U.S. and going across um, to other countries is placing another, for, uh, giving us an opportunity to place another focus on the impact on immigrants and refugees in our communities, often used um, as scapegoats in other times for other reasons, but it allows us to look at um, all, you know, our entire community as one comprehensive, holistic community, all working together towards one goal. And so, I think what we've looked at here in the U.S. is um, the role, for example, that that resettled refugees have had in responding to the pandemic. You know, that they are essential workers, um, that that they are able to um, to speak out on behalf of the Black Lives Matter movement too. That they are active participants of our community, not just outsiders. I think that's that's sort of the unique perspective that they can have on, on being um, individuals who've seen other places around the world, who've lived in other kinds of governance structures and they're here for a reason and really speaking to the truth of what our, our democracy um, is built on. So I think it's, it allows us to have that opportunity to, to think about the unique perspective that that population can have on these kinds of conversations. <laughs> One thing I think that we can't sort of overstate is that COVID-19 and this pandemic um, has exposed and deepened long-standing racial um, inequalities in our country. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the, um, 
the marches and the protests and the uprisings in response to the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others, um, it's not just about police violence. It's about a society that doesn't treat um, Black people and people of color equally to other people. And those incidents have been a spark. Um, but I think that the pandemic has really forced us to think about what do we value in our society and what is necessary and needed in our society. Um, and I think many people when this pandemic hit looked and thought we had a safety net that would catch us and found out that we didn't. Um, and that the people who were falling through first and hardest um, were black people, were Latinx people, were immigrants, were refugees who didn't have the ability to um, to stop that fall, right? Um, because those safety nets have been so eroded over time. And I think that the uprisings were about all of that and about the fact that our society isn't providing the types of supports and services that we think we need. And I think people have really had a moment to say, what is it that we value? And what is it that we want to spend our government money on and our taxes on? And I think the answer has been not the police and not um, a system that um, is oppressing and impacting um, uh, Black people in such a horrific way. Um, and, you know, before I end that comment, I don't want to sort of stop it before I lift up some of the groups that have been doing this work in D.C. Um, Black Lives Matter D.C., um, who the committee represents, the Stop Cop Terror Project, Black Swan Academy, and, and many others. You always have that problem when you start listing groups that you think of others as you're talking. Um, but there's so many that have really been on the street and have been um, organizing not only the uprisings and the protests, but mutual aid networks and thinking about how to keep communities safe in this time. And so don't want to let the moment pass um, without lifting up those groups as well. Definitely. So then transitioning to a final question, how can law students and lawyers work right now to advance justice? And uh, Professor Banner, if it's okay, we can start with you to uh, talk about this. Sure. I mean, I think there's a million ways. And I think the thing to do is to think about what you're good at and then do that for justice. Um, so if what you're good at is litigating and you're at a law firm, figure out a way to get involved with pro bono. Um, if you can write policy and write legislation, you know, think about how to volunteer or think about how to find the organizations who do that. Um, if you're a really good cook, make a bunch of food and bring it to a homeless shelter because there's a lot of people who don't have food and who don't have houses right now. Um, so, so that's not particular advice maybe for law students or, or lawyers. I think everyone can do that, but I think that lawyers and law students have a particular set of skills that they can bring to this fight and it's important that we do bring them. Um, you know, the committee works closely um, on all of our cases with pro bono counsel. We would not be able to do the work that we do without our pro bono attorneys. Um, who come from big and small firms throughout the city and the country and, and litigate alongside us and help us have, be able to have the capacity and the reach that we do um, to fight for civil rights. So find those opportunities, think about those opportunities, um, and lift them up to yourselves, to your networks, um, to the other people that you're working with. Great. So Ms. McPherson, can you add to that as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. So we at JRS have a network of advocates that we support in terms of providing um, information on key advocacy issues and opportunities to take action. If you go to our website, jrsusa.org, you can sign up and receive our action alerts. Um, we, we just did one last week on refugee resettlement to make sure that the Congress is consulted as the president is preparing to, um, to deliver or announce his numbers for refugee resettlement for the next fiscal year. But beyond, we'd like to see those numbers go up. Um, there was a, a new rule that was proposed related to asylum and we asked our advocates to um, submit their comments so that um, opposing the rule, because it was a rule that would be detrimental um, to our asylum proceedings and would really chip away at our asylum system even further. Um, so there are periodic opportunities like that that we can offer up to our advocates. So I would encourage anyone to sign up and take action. As a constituent here in the U.S., you have a voice and you can use that voice on behalf of um, these vulnerable populations. In addition to that, um, Professor Banner mentioned um, doing some pro bono work and we've worked with Georgetown Law in the past with other Jesuit law schools to try to identify law students, professors, who can provide um, pro bono legal services in particular at the US Southern border. Um, it's 
challenging now because of limited travel and then also because asylum seekers aren't being allowed onto the U.S. side. So we actually need a lot of support on the Mexican side. Um, but but there are some um, pro bono um, law students and lawyers who are able to provide that counsel um, across the border telephonically. So there's opportunities. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, happy to um, to talk further about that, but there's certainly a need. There is a huge um, gap in access to legal representation for asylum seekers um, with very few accessing um, any kind of counsel. And that of course makes it very challenging for them to successfully plead their case. So, um, so if anyone is interested in doing that, I highly encourage it. Great, and then Mr. Mahalan, could you finish this off with a final comment? Yeah, no, I think an incredible practical way that law students can can assist is you think about in this country right now, there's a, a dizzying array of executive orders and, and local ordinances and law changing all the time. And like a practical example is if there's if you're in an area that has a, you know, a stay on foreclosures or evictions, uh, get, getting law. Uh, we had some law students at our, our area law school, uh, Rutgers Camden that have put together these documents as part of a clinical they were part of and distributed them to all the stakeholders throughout the community because these current rules are so hard to find. They're hard to find. They're not necessarily clean, clearly put on the internet. One of the, one of the great skills that legally trained individuals have is this capacity to distill complicated information and put it in a, in a way that is presentable and useful. And, and in addition to summarizing the, the underlying law pointing people in, in the direction of additional resources, both to understand that deeper, but also perhaps to legal aid opportunities or legal clinics. So that's one practical way. I think the other thing to remember is that you can't pour out of an empty glass. And some of the most powerful work that law students have done too is advocate for some of their own issues that are resulting from COVID-19. Throughout the country, we've grappled with, for, for law students graduating uh, this, this past year, of how to administer a bar exam in a, in a fair and e equitable way. I mean, we've already seen that there's issues with bar passage rates that, that fall you know, along the demographic lines, that it, there's been questions about whether or not it's you know, a racially biased ex examination to begin with, or does it harm people of certain income levels? But in this particular situation, when states went entirely remote, and we, we sort of had all the exact same issues we talked about at the beginning of the conversation is, do individuals have access to reliable internet? Do they even have a room in their home where there's not gonna be someone else who's seen on the camera in these situations of virtual proctoring? There are, you know, there's individuals that they have to share a room with their siblings who are also home being ex examined. So seeing the advocacy of law students about like whether it's calling for a diploma privilege or calling for a right to practice under an existing attorney, just I was inspired by law students coming together to ask for those sorts of things, both for themselves and their peers, but also exposing this issue of, of licensure generally and, and these sort of weird tweaks we're making to exams that perhaps what we need to do, and I've started to think this out with some law students and some advocates, is maybe we need to create a statute to challenge licensure on, you know, for being disproportionate in a discriminatory sense especially these temporary procedures, that if we can prove that some form of licensure is, is, has a dis, disproportionate impact on some group that's greater than the prior exam, perhaps it just needs to be thrown out. But those are really practical examples. One is distilling information, pointing individuals in the resources, but also taking the moment to make sure that the legal profession remains, continues to strive for more justice in, in itself. So thank you so much for a great conversation, uh, Professor Vander, Ms. McPherson, and Mr. Mulholland, and thank you for your work as well during the pandemic. I, I, it's essential that we have uh, such incredible minds working right now to provide services and to make change where it's needed. I'd also like to thank again Professor Gostin for opening this event and contributing with such helpful information and, and, and really framing this conversation. The event would not have been possible without all of the work of the ECLU Executive Board, Georgetown's administration, as well as the Office of Student Life. While we have to applaud you virtually right now, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for everyone who participated in and watched tonight's discussion. The fight for justice continues even amid a pandemic, and I hope that this conversation helped provide some concrete ways to get involved and start thinking about acting to fight injustice.
Uh, one way to do that is to join us on September 30th. We have another panel on voting rights sponsored by the ACLU that will be virtual. You can also sign up for our email, emailing list using the link in the description for this video. For the entire ACLU Executive Board, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope to see you on September 30th, and for now, good night.